Raf. James Bazaar. No hairdressers open on a Monday night. Have you heard that? I, you're hearing it more and more. We're sitting here. It's a Monday night. Nothing's open. What do you think about that? I think. What happened to the 24 hour city? What about be brave? As it just like a concept. I should. You should just be brave. As in, so like everyone, every restaurant and like every hairdresser is just like, we have all decided that Monday is the night that we're gonna shut it down because people have had their weekend and now they're trying to lock in and they've got no interest on doing anything on doing uh, errands or anything mm. like what are people doing but monday night ratings are pretty bad on tv as well from my understanding it's a bit of a dead zone but not for us because we come and we record a podcast on a monday night that's correct you know you're just, hearing this on a wednesday morning we didn't all, record it last night no we or record, this morning we nope. didn't record it wednesday morning no nope, we recorded it on monday night so while you were you know like being like oh t- hate Mondays. Which I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to go to a, get we, a haircut and I'm certainly not going to watch anything on TV. I wish I was still the weekend. God, I wish I wish I was still off work and chill it out with my friends and family and loved ones. While you're sooking, we're recording a podcast. Rise and grind. <laughs> All right, today we're we're picking up on a theme that we touched on a few weeks ago. No, okay, I'm going to just lay it out flat. Things are getting serious. Like in the world? All of a sudden we're talking law. We're talking about law and we're talking about profit. Yeah. We're talking about like, you know... Name... Name top three things in the world. I'll wait. We've been we've been lollygagging around for too long, talking about generative AI and making weird little pictures on Mid Journey, and telling ChatGPT to write you a poem, all that kind of crap. But now the chickens have come home to roost, and people have got to start making money. Yeah, or following the law. Right. There's got to be guidelines. There's got to be rules. And there's got to be profit. And there's got to be profit. Yeah, yeah. That's it. No more fucking around and, you know, being like, oh, is the AI going to kill us all? Yeah, none of okay. this. Okay, Le- leave that in the past. That's pathetic. EAC. Effective accelerationism. That's just a glimmer in the eye. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's it. Actually, did you see that, that funny thing the other day? I thought this was quite amusing. There was a whole new schism in, like, the effective accelerationist movement. The EAC. No, no I missed, the, I no, missed the, the schism. Go on. Basically... They, you know, as many movements do these days, mm. it tore itself apart over trans rights. <laughs> <laughs> trans rights is torn apart the EAC movement. <laughs> yeah, because and I actually found this quite amusing. Basically, one of the EAC guys, mm. I don't know which one it was, but he's got EAC and he's using the name and he's always talking about how we need to accelerate and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Did, like, he quite tweeted some post about pride... Or I can't remember what the exact post was, but it was along the lines of like any doctor who performs this sort of surgery should be jailed. And then, quite rightly, the other side of the EAC movement was like, "What does like accelerationism mean to you?" Yeah, like, I know. I was like, going to say, like, doesn't transhumanism and all that shit like, surely like in your idea of like the sci-fi future, being able to change gender and yeah, like yeah. live like your internal truth, shouldn't that be like part of the parcel? Mm. So he's basically saying like we need to achieve escape velocity we need to like achieve full entropy spread humanity across the stars leave yeah, yeah. behind our earthly bodies but you cannot be trans <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 exactly live like it is a call to uh the overly sentimental to even consider your bodily life as being valuable <laughs> Your intellectual life has got so much more value, except if that intellectual version of yourself that is just like ones and zeros, like replication of your brain, if that has a different gender. I I find that a little bit weird. (laughs) Like, what if the kind of brain simulation of you has a different gender than the body that we were supposed to forget about was biologically born as? Don't know. I'm going to say there's a contradiction yeah. in this philosophy. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm... sorry. This is this. Sorry, that goes out to um, the people in the Discord who said like on the last episode I was like a bit restrained. <laughs> yeah, someone someone did say that you were a bit subdued because you were ill, <laughs> uh, which I thought was. I'm a, back. I thought it was a bit of a low blow, just quietly. But anyway, you're back and you're fired up. Anyway, that was a bit of a diversion. Yeah, yeah. Today we're going to talk about like we're talk- two we're- big topics. Yeah, we're, yeah. So we're talking about a few things. First of all, is following on from some conversations we had a a couple of weeks ago, we're talking about like 
the episode title was The NVIDIA Wall. It was mm. this idea, basically, that Jensen Huang, NVIDIA, NVIDIA CEO, was getting a little bit antsy and started to think that maybe... He was worried. He was worried. That was that was the headline of the article. He is worried because it was that essentially the insane bull run of NVIDIA was coming to an end. Mm. And it has had a correction. Yeah. It had a pretty significant correction, yeah. but it's still... You know, a very, very you're still up for the year. Well, you're still you're certainly up from the first time that Dan Round talked about Nvidia. Yeah, the Nvidia so, share so price. if you, if you hit uh, buy on your uh, fucking eToro account the moment you heard us say Nvidia, yeah, when we said don't short Nvidia, if you proceeded to not short it and in fact buy it, you, you're doing well. No, but um, there's been a few other little bits and pieces that have come out over the past few weeks regarding the money side of AI. Mm. Again, we talked about the fact that. Some investors, some shareholders in like Meta and Microsoft earnings calls have sort of been like, when can we expect to see a, some revenue from this capital expenditure that you're putting into AI? I.e. I- buying NVIDIA graphics cards. But in- let, let's talk about the chain very quickly. We'll do it from companies want to do AI. Is that it's the top of the chain? Completely rational desire. For the most part, they will then go to a cloud provider. The big ones being... Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Microsoft, and say, we would like to do some AI on some graphics cards, please, on some GPUs, which are the best for AI. Sure, we've talked about it ad nauseum. Microsoft, Google, and Amazon say, sure, you can rent these GPUs off us. The GPUs that they're renting are NVIDIA graphics cards that they bought from NVIDIA. Yep. I feel like that's the layman's way. So if you want to like do like... we. We're, we're Colgate and we want to do some AI on our customer base or whatever it is. Um, they are renting it off whoever their cloud service provider is, et cetera, et cetera. That leads to a huge demand from the cloud because the cloud service providers are getting like all of these businesses saying we want to do AI and rent your GPUs. They buy more GPUs. If NVIDIA, NVIDIA all of a sudden is worth $2 trillion. Yeah, and that's basically right. But for those... And, and, and sorry, and I should just, as a brief aside, then you have the Metas of the world and the Teslas of the world who are buying it more for their personal use. So like Meta, being Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, etc., they need shitloads of graphics cards because A, they use them for like feed recommendation algorithms and B, you now can ask Meta anything and have a generative AI performed for you. That's right. Open yeah. AI, same deal. Yep. So there's like, yeah, there's these trickle down effects. A lot of companies want to get into AI, and it's really being provided by a small number of companies, a because they're doing it as cloud providers, as you say, but also you know Microsoft and the OpenAI tie up buying the insane number of graphics card they need to do the training and then the inference and whatever. And it's- sorry to interrupt. It is going to take me many years before I stop saying graphics cards. I will continue to call these things graphics cards. Yeah, no, and it's 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 kind of I mean, as is my right. No, it's yeah, it's not entirely accurate, but it's not wrong that's what they that's what they originally started at anyway so as i said a few a few investors have basically said mostly at kind of these hyperscaler companies that are providing the infrastructure or buying up a buying up a lot of graphics cards because yeah the ai spend is mostly on getting gpus mm. or you know nvidia chips but also like buying data like building build, yeah. building data centers power yeah if you listen to our episode the other week about uh nuclear power power cooling yeah, all that stuff. Very expensive. But um, And some investors have been like, okay, it's wonderful that you're investing in all this stuff. But, you know, because one thing to bring up is that if you're a tech investor and you're interested in investing in technology or whatever, one cautionary tale that will stick in your brain is the story of the telco companies just before the dot-com crash mm. when it looked like you had a hockey stick growth of people getting online. Yeah, people are going to get online. Don't buy the gold, buy the picks. Sell the shovels. Sell, sell the shovels, folks. Sell the shovels. And again, I stress, I don't think anyone of the gold fields was making a mozza selling shovels no. and pickaxes. The However, gold the gold you, was the real game. Yeah, if, you, if you found a nugget, on the other hand... <laughs> you, probably, you probably would do an okay trade. Yeah, I mean, if you could mark up your shovels, yeah... 70 to 80 percent okay maybe now we're talking no that's great like you're copying a shovel at one penny and selling it for eight penny (laughs) you know that's not that's not a bad business but it doesn't really compare to getting a big nasty nugget (laughs) yeah worth a (laughs) hundred dollars folks you know rub the numbers here uh but no back in the yeah back in the day the world wide web had come to life people were getting online they were going via aol Mm. I'm talk- we're talking about the US, obviously. 
um, the telcos were like, oh, shit. The internet use is just up and up and up and up from here. Mm. Uh, and they laid an absurd amount of infrastructure. Yeah, fiber optic infrastructure. Fiber, fiber optics. They're like, well, people are going to get online correctly. They pointed this out. Yep. People are going to want fast internet. We got to invest in the capital expenditure to make the future possibilities of the internet accessible. We got to get it down now. And they did. And yeah. then what happened? The dot com crash happened. Yeah, because it turns out you couldn't actually make any money online. The classic example is pets.com. It was like, which right now you're like, yeah, that's a genius idea. So you order pet food online and have it delivered to your door. Unfortunately, obviously, none of the infrastructure existed. None of the customers existed. You couldn't deliver anything. Postage yeah. was so insanely expensive. Um, and, well, I mean, fundamentally, the issue was like, no one wanted to dial up on their internet and then order pet food from an online store. Yeah. And, and sorry, pets.com, I should say, was worth like billions of dollars. Yeah, after its IPO. Uh, but basically what happened is the dot-com crash happened. A lot of these companies that had laid the fiber optic cable in the US went under. They yeah. collapsed because they, they couldn't make money. It was like a complete fugazi. Mm. Obviously, with the benefit of time, when other companies came and bought out that infrastructure, Google did it. Well, Google, Google bought m- much of it. Yeah. Like all of this... Google, which survived, obviously, because they were really only getting born around there. They bought most of the quote-unquote dark fiber. All of these companies had put fiber optic cables in the ground. Google bought it because they'd gone bankrupt. They're, it's a bankrupt company with an asset now that was like massively uncool, no current business model. And I mean, you know, it now obviously looks like a genius move on the part of Google. Google, I feel like in those early days, yes, they did a brilliant thing with algorithmic search, like crawlers, web crawlers, algorithmic responses. And this, like, maybe it was an absolutely genius move that, like, was had heaps of foresight, but maybe it was also like, oh, it's basically free and we can move our data between our data centers quicker. Regardless, the outcome was that Google owned fiber optic networks around the country. Yeah. And, and for like, basically free. That's right. And there were other, like, roll-ups and companies that came and acquired parts of these networks and still operate mm. as like cabling providers to this day. But the point was that the the value didn't emerge until much later mm. and the people who originally made the investments weren't the ones that benefited yeah. from it. And the, this example has sort of come up in the minds of some investors and analysts today when looking at the AI stuff. Mm. Essentially, an insane amount of CapEx or capital expenditure is going into AI right now. And yes, you know, Microsoft and Meta, these are very financially healthy companies that can certainly take... Microsoft and Meta ain't going bust anytime soon. They they can take the hit. Um, But there are still people being like, it will take a lot of customer revenue or like productivity improvements or whatever you want to call it to like catch up with the amount of CapEx that you're currently putting into this thing. Point being... A lot of the money is being wasted. Yeah. I think that's that's basically the implication here, right? It's like people are buying shitloads of NVIDIA graphics cards and in a few years' time, no one will want the capacity. Yeah, because basically, as we've kind of talked about in the pod a few times, the killer app for AI has not emerged yet. No. Like we haven't seen what it, what it might be. I So can I... Now it's time for me to go off again. Not go off. But no, I, please I do. I suppose have a nuanced no, opinion. Go off. Unfortunately, this is the thing. Nowadays, a huge contrarian take is just the nuanced center. My personal opinion is... <laughs> is that right, do you think? <laughs> why not? <laughs> no, well, no, I will say this, and people have mentioned this about Downround, like, for all of our fucking this, that, and the other... Our many, our many faults. <laughs> many public faults. Our position is typically actually, like, pretty neutral. Like, it's pretty much like they both have a point. Anyway, um, I'm talking about the French election, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um... Like, I actually think that, yes, of course, there's going to be some companies go bust. Like, for example, like, you know, the music generation companies, even the image generation companies to a certain extent, are these multi, multi multi-billion dollar revenue companies? Yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine they would be. It's kind of hard to see a business model there. And I'm sure you could read some decks that suggest there are. Sure, there's going to be some companies that go bust. Like, but I do see a bunch of value being generated in very boring AI stuff. And I've said this before, like before, like customer help desk stuff, instead of having a yeah, a customer service representative or a sales representative or whatever, like answer from their memory or search up 
yeah, things yeah, yeah. In, a, in, in a fucking knowledge base or whatever, have it vaguely generated for them and they just like, much like the Google auto reply or whatever, and they're basically just approving responses and ensuring that it like works. Things like that actually create a, a huge percentage of efficiencies. They, I think they do, but I also, I contend that like even, let's imagine every company instituted like ai for customer service yeah and it and on average it reduced the bill or like the labor costs of customer service by 50 percent yeah 75 percent or whatever assume like a really high number like is that well i mean I, so the i've i've looked at into these numbers and i'm going to pull them out of my ass from memory but i'm my understanding is like the international spend on digital customer service desks is something like 200 billion dollars a year right yeah, yeah, yeah. so like there are I'm not saying that like a you can achieve that great. There's a hundred billion dollars of value, but like there is even if that number is half as much, it's sure it doesn't make up for the insane amount of capex that's being spent. But there is like a significant chunk of yeah. efficiencies being generated there. It's not negligible. It might yeah. not justify the expense, but like there are a bunch of boring aspects that AI will make more efficient. Not in the like sack your work workforce yeah, yeah. way but in there like mm, at the, yeah. people are going to stop hiring these type at, of people at the, yeah yeah at the margins so one of the reasons i did this story is a few uh, like equity reports have come out or like equity analysis have come out from a few different sources mm. like big ones i'm talking like goldman sachs barclays sequoia capital have come out and basically been like mm, you know all of them have essentially made the argument that ai is consequential and it's gonna you may disagree about the extent to which yeah, it's yeah. going to change the global economy or how quickly it will but they all basically agree that it will to a certain extent but they're kind of like will it all all of them have essentially made the point can they outrun their capex problem like goldman claims that cumulatively over the next few years a trillion dollars is going to be spent mm. on ai yeah um and sequoia called it ai's 600 billion dollar question which mm. is basically that 600 billion dollars of revenue has to be generated from AI across the tech industry annually to cover the expanded, like the capex, and then also essentially the inference costs. Mm. Keeping in mind that you know inference and and training, this the costs may come down eventually. Yeah. Goldman said this is a, a funny quote. This is from um, Jim Cavello, who is their head of equity research. This is him talking about like the costs of running AI, basically, he, uh, and and essentially the idea of like being able to replace certain kinds of human labor with mm. it. He was like, replacing low-wage jobs with tremendously costly technology is basically the polar opposite of the prior technology transitions I've witnessed in my 30 years of closely following the tech industry, which is kind of interesting mm. because he's, the point that he made throughout the this Goldman report is that you know the internet basically provided a situation where you could use the distribution effect of the internet for something like Amazon to sort of arbitrage your way into being much cheaper than existing books or big book distribution channels. Yeah, yeah. Whereas he's been like, here it's basically saying to you, you can replace a person with like a really, really expensive process. Yeah, that's that also might be wrong. That also could that also could be wrong and may need human oversight as well. Yeah. It is an interesting point. And it's one of those things where it's like and Goldman makes this point and so does Barclays. The idea is like nobody agrees on the percentage of GDP increase this stuff is going to confer. No, yeah. In fact, Goldman quotes a guy who's like an MIT professor, Darren uh, Asamoglu. I'm going to say that's how you pronounce that surname. Nailed it. Uh, he estimated that AI will increase US productivity by 0.5% and GDP by 0.9%. Yeah, that seems to be about the numbers. Yeah. Cumulatively over the next decade, which is lower than some people who are like... Yeah, yeah, it's up to like... But even like the bullish ones are you know two percent kind of vibes. yeah I mean, which, you know, it's not nothing it's but. not it's not nothing um but it's just it's interesting as people are just trying to f line up the numbers basically and being like okay yeah it, and with all the caveats of for the accounting heads obviously it's capital expenditure that you can depreciate over time it's an asset on your balance sheet etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's not you know this isn't the word it's not an expense yeah don't come after us <laughs> you know uh, I think that this is though why it's probably worse for NVIDIA and like I don't want to fucking harp on to the like financials but like NVIDIA have to keep selling top of the line chips whereas if the AI kind of boom cools off a little bit then the data centers like Microsoft, Google who are on selling this stuff, Amazon they don't necessarily need to buy the latest hot thing from NVIDIA 
they can sit on their capex. They they can sit on their current. Yeah. Whatever, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of the, a boring point. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of of the opinion that yes, you're going to see companies go bust. You're going to see the the equivalent of the pets.coms go bust. And like people have made this point before, like that. Yeah, right now the in order to get into AI, like if I want to train or create. A foundation model, as they say, like an open AI, a new chat GPT or whatever. I want to get in at the ground floor. It's cost prohibitive. Like you have to spend billions on fucking graphics cards yep. or like hiring them. And, and talent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And talent for that matter, blah, blah, blah. But if we have a dark fiber moment, much like Google bought up this dark fiber at the time, they didn't really have it that much of a use for it. But as the internet grew, they grew into it. What you will have in a few years time is like actually... Anyone can buy a friggin' H100, like an NVIDIA GPU that currently you can buy on Alibaba, sorry, AliExpress for 25 grand. If you can cop one of them for two and a half grand because there's just a massive oversupply and everyone who bought them went bust. And like, you know, there's nation states buying the, these, you know, startups raising at a billion dollar valuation to spend a hundred million dollars on fucking graphics cards. <coughs> I will c- continue to call them graphics cards. No, um, please. A100s, H100s, blah, blah, blah. But yes, you'll have this situation where in a few years' time, all of a sudden you have these like high-performance AI chips that you can buy for dirt cheap may actually lead to this kind of second spring, this oasis oh, yeah. in the I mean, desert. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you know, a lot of it is this idea that we're in sort of the picks and shovels era where everybody's building the tooling, you know, the foundation models, the chips, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's a bit of hand-waving where it's kind of like, oh, look... Once we get this fundamental stuff out of the way and we figure out how to make it more efficient and less costly, the end user or like the B2B or the whatever applications will shake themselves out of the tree. Yeah, well, but that's the thing. The AI that I personally want to see is the stuff we've talked about again, like is, you know, being able to ask friggin' Siri, what time does my mom's plane land? Yep. This, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. That, but across everything, like across your email, not just looking up a random keyword in your email account and it's just like gives you 200 emails that you also have to scroll through and like work out the other keywords and try and guess like what were the words I used in the group chat. This like just getting used to everything being conveniently served to you will at some point, once that is the table stakes for technology is like I expect to be able to use natural language at all times with every piece of technology I use and it will deliver what I expect. Then... We'll need all of the fucking compute, you know? Well, yeah, and then that's what they're establishing now. But one, one other interesting... But who will make money? Well, that's it. Who's making the money? One interesting data point as well that came from this Barclays note that they sent around to investors. They were talking about... Well, first there was one interesting point where they said, we think that one of the big players is going to blink and cut back the CapEx on AI expenditure. Like mm. someone like... The idea being someone like Microsoft or... Meta is Meta. the obvious one, I think. Yeah, I think Meta being like... Mm. Because they're not on selling it. So the difference between like Meta are integrating it into their like products and services, right? Like yeah. Meta, you can't, I can't be like, okay, down round, we want to start dicking around with AI. We want to start generating friggin' AI podcasts. Right now we would go to AWS, Google and Microsoft and just rent GPUs. We would, we would rent compute and build it on them. We obviously can't do that with Meta. Meta are one of the hugest... and. Tesla is the other one, but like Meta are one of the hugest players in the space where they are buying a shit ton of NVIDIA GPUs. There's some, listen to our old episodes, some interesting kind of history and that they actually like committed to buy a bunch when NVIDIA stock was down and Meta stock was down, blah, 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 fine. Metaverse related, weird, interesting quirk of history potentially. Um, But they are doing it for their own platforms. And that is like a big one where it's like, how is Meta making money off AI other than cheaper, right? Like more effective ads, sure. Yeah, I mean, do they have the that weird vaporous thing where they could say, oh, look, we're using all this to improve our ad engine, our Reels algorithm. Yeah, yeah. All this shit. Algorithm better, but they also do have an AI search bar. And it's yeah, like- they do. And they're also, ta- like, I can't even imagine. I would love to know what, like, their volume is. Because surely it's really high. Because you see all those, like, Facebook AI slop accounts just, like, churning out what I guess is, like, meta generated images yeah. and shit like that like they, it must just be getting hammered with that crap I we're guess. just like completely pointless the crap. only like the only times I've come like actually used it is literally like in the group chat people being a bit funny once a month 
Yeah. If that. You're not you're not the core audience here. But uh, the other interesting part of this Barclays note is that they called out from like some Google documentation or some Google investor representation or whatever they were doing. They basically said that the amount of volume that Google is expecting, at least they claim to be expecting or can be inferred from their commentary, is like astronomical. Mm -hmm. Because they basically said, you know, based on these estimates, Google is assuming around 180 trillion AI text queries, both input and output, and 15 trillion AI image queries which is a staggering figure as there's around 11 trillion web search queries per year right now worldwide, basically saying that Google's AI CapEx assumes a market that is 15 to 20 times larger than the web search market by 2026. I can potentially see it only insofar as AI doing a whole heap of shit behind the scenes for you, right? Yeah. That's the only way that can be possible. Yeah. Is it's like on Android or whatever. And also the story came out that a lot of the a lot of Apple's models are trained on TPUs, like Google's tensor processing units. Yeah, it's a it's a big number, but it has to assume that, right? It, it can't just be like people are going to search more. Be, be be using yeah, like ask the AI more than they're currently asking. It, it has to be um, predictive kind of stuff, like in the background, because it comes back to that idea where it's like if you're processing that money increase per year, and assume that like AI costs. Let's say they, even if they're ten percent of what they are right now, mm. that's the cost for that is astronomical. just astronomical yeah, yeah. compared to that many search queries. Which, as we've said time and time again, Google has done a phenomenal job in making each search inquiry cost nothing and take the tiniest micro fraction of a second yeah. to execute. Whereas this stuff doesn't. Even you know GPT four O is really quick, but it's not that quick. No, it's not. You Google can still quick. see. You can still see it you know, slowly writing or whatever. Yeah. Um, Which is a point of friction and I think is probably not talked about em- enough where it's like, it's it's annoying as a user that like, it makes me use AI less. Yeah. And I know that like using perplexity or using AI, even though it'll probably give me a better answer and it'll get straight to the point. Like I have to wait for it to friggin' generate, even when it's like a couple seconds, but that's just the human mind. Like we're just, we're trained to this and, and Google yeah. knew that from the outset. Like yeah. they, they always would go to the, they would spend billions to shave off like, you know, 0.01 of a second or whatever. That's right. Um, so the answer to all that is who knows? Who knows how they're going to make money? But I suppose they go, they better. I'm no, I'm planting myself squarely in the camp of, I think we've been in, both been in this yeah. camp for like the literally the entire thing of Dan Round. So it's not like, oh, <coughs> a huge, revelation. Huge statement. Yes, a bunch of companies are going to go bust. Yeah. And it's unclear, but quite obviously, in five years' time, there will be a shitload of AI going on at all times in our life that we'll be completely used to. And it's just like a natural part of life, and that you'll look like an idiot if you ever would have said that AI is, is stupid and a bust. But I mean, there's very, f- there are. I was gonna say there's very few people who are like AI is stupid and a bust, but there are a contingent of people who are like. Yeah, there's a bunch of people that are like that. Although, as I think I've said in the podcast before, a lot of it is, I think, very wishful thinking from people who, for very legitimate reasons, think it's like aesthetically bankrupt, which it often is. Yes, or, I don't disagree or, with that. Or morally bankrupt because of the copyright stuff. I ref- I refuse to have a comment on that. <laughs> Um, you do. I mean, I, I I put it to you that you've said in the past that AI that copyright is the last bastion of creativity on this earth. <laughs> That's true. I've said that. <laughs> I, guilty. You, you the, the, the only the only thing to bulwark against unif- uniformity and context collapse and the death of meaning mm-hmm. is uh, the right of rigid, copy. rigidly enforced copyright law. Um, and I do think that there are a lot of people who for what I think are quite legitimate reasons, want it to fail. Because there's there's basically like... There's multiple things, let's be frank. Yeah. Like, but I, there's I, I think fear that, of the unknown. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, like, I, I have that a lot myself. Yes. I don't like seeing Every new morning. stuff happen. Ah! Yeah, exactly. I think there's like... people. Basically, people really conflate the two arguments of like, I think AI sucks, which is very valid for a lot of, a lot of different dimensions, yeah. with AI sucks, as in it's never going to be able to do anything. Yeah. I think those things, two things get conflated in like a way that is unhelpful mm. because I think it's pretty evident that even if it does suck in the first sense of the word, it's still going to be deployed massively. 
Yes. And we're going to see so much more of it. And it, like, it's going to keep happening. Even if it's not even 60% as good as what the old version of something was, we're going to see a lot more of it being deployed in various cost-saving... Well, yeah, that that's kind of like the original meaning of the word disruption is that something that is potentially like technically worse, but much cheaper, it's got a completely different cost structure, Yeah, dominates, which is like, you know, the case of, you know, news versus newspaper or whatever yeah. it is, like it, it's... It's not. It's not better. It's just cheaper. Yeah. It, and, and it redefines. It disrupts the cost structure. It, it disrupts the business model. Well, that's right. Yeah. Like of an industry if, or whatever. If the cost of content creation goes to zero, which mm. it, well, I mean, not zero, but you know, basically zero compared to hiring people. Bas- basically, yeah, exactly. Zero compared to whatever. People are going to use that, and they're going to yeah. deploy it in all sorts of like funky ways. And we're already seeing that. Like spam, you know, is a funny way of of looking at it, and like these weird spammy facebook accounts that have popped up Mm. like my wife ali was looking at this she was sitting on the couch and scrolling through it as she was like talking through it to me she found like some facebook page like Mm. a facebook page that was like it had like some woman's name it was like olivia's recipes or something Mm. but all the images were very clearly ai generated Mm. and all the recipes were like very clearly ai generated but the person who was running it or like the i don't know consortium of like (laughs) dudes who are running it yeah or whatever was um, basically tr- maintaining this voice that was kind of like a little bit friendly and like what you would kind of expect to see in an actual page that was like that. Yeah, yeah. Except it was all completely fucking fake. Yeah. But all the posts had like hundreds of thousands of likes mm. and what seemed like genuine people. And Ali was like going through and looking at this shit and following the paper trail and it looked like the account had been bought from someone else. Yeah, or yeah, like yeah. It was like a real web of shit. But looking at that, you were like, someone has just used AI to hack together this fucking demented business. Yeah. And it's clearly functional and working and probably bringing in revenue somehow. That Do that times a million. Yeah, well, and like the, the landscape of content and the way we engage with the world is fundamentally changed. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this the other week where it's just like... In when they when the internet started and you had people being like, "How good is this? Anyone can make a web page," and they went, "This is going to set us all free." Oh yeah, the liber the the liberatory power of the internet. But it's like everyone can create anything on this place. Like, where is that really going to lead? And and this is where we are, especially when you then have like the Facebooks and it's like, oh, you don't even have to build websites or anything like that. You literally just post. You don't even have to like. You've got the CMS. The CMS is ready-made in the form of social media yep. and you just have to post and anyone can do it and you can do it algorithm. Like you can do it using an algorithm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And here's where we are. We said, I think in the media episode, like the internet has never been worse. And yeah. I mean, that's almost, it's such a truism, but it's like, this is the best it's ever going to be. <laughs> it's, it's all downhill for you. Like, but you've got to be celebrating it. Don't think about how nice the internet was when you were using it in 2002 or whatever. Like right now just, just is, the, is, the be- <laughs> is the best the internet is ever going to be for the rest of your life. Every successive day, more horrors. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what it is. And it, and it started with, with the idea of anyone can post anything. And it's like, here we are. Yeah, the internet is an inherently liberalizing force. People used to believe that stuff. Yeah, but to bring it back to down around areas. So, you know, the, again, and to Google. Google were like, okay, cool. There are way, there's going to be way too many websites for humans to index them manually. Obviously, again, right now Great it seems bet. so friggin' obvious. Phenomenal bet. Uh, like, we need to organize the world's information. And now it's like, that doesn't really... Like, being the interface between... Um, people and discovering the various aspects of the internet no longer cuts it because there's just too much fucking shit. Like the internet is fucked. Like it, it is a terrible and horrible place. Yeah, there's too, there's, there's, there's there's too, too much shit. There's too much shit and, and crap. It, and and it's being produced far too quickly in far too high a volume. So you need to now like abstract it. Like and that's the idea of an a rag model LLM, right? Like when when you ask AI something, it's abstracting that. Like, yeah, it's abstracting yeah. the bullshit away. Yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, I, yeah. that was, like, the, the thesis I said a little while down around where I was, like, the whole pitch of AI is that there's so much shit out there online and it can, in a perfect world, narrow it to what you need at any given moment mm. in a way that's semantic and, like, at least gives the illusion of understanding the meaning of what you want rather than, like, trying to hack together search terms on Google or whatever. Yeah. But you know, on the other side of the thing is like AI is doing that, but it's also like creating it, creating yeah, which more is why more shit. It, which is, makes it more essential. 
Like yeah. it makes it more essential to have something more than just like a keyword indexer or whatever to like hide the shit that it is enabling. That it's already making. And uh, at some point in that basically like never ending high pressure faucet of shit, <laughs> someone has to make some money. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hey, Raf. Hey, James. Did you know that you can get an extra episode of Down Round every single week mm-hmm. on top of the one that you're already getting? Yeah, I knew that. Well, yeah, obviously you know, but the but, person is... I'm using you as a vessel to yeah, explain. Sorry, as I'm the listener. No, go and tell me more, James. How a, much does it cost? A mere $7 a month, Raf. Okay, where do I go to find out more about this? You go to downround.net. Okay, I want it. Well, I'm sure you do. I feel like I'm missing out by not having it. Exactly. No ads. Second episode per week. And a few other little goodies that are coming down the pipeline as well. Head to downround.net. Downround.net. And sign up to Downround Premium.